Let me read to you again that last verse that Carl just read. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. We look now at Ruth chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 1. We've been going through the book of Ruth and the uh, preaching of God's word here. And I remind you that this is God's word, eternally true. Ruth chapter 4, verse 1. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz says, said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should bring this matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabites, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it, because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech Kilion and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabites, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. And verse 11. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. Here ends our reading. We have a response of thankfulness that's printed for us at the bottom left of our bulletin. The word of the Lord. Thanks. And I mentioned in this, our prayer this morning that, that Luke 24, Jesus walks with his disciples after his resurrection. And he explains to them that all the scriptures, the Old Testament, had been speaking of him. There are, are, are ways in which all of the, what has actually happened in history were foreshadowings of who Jesus would be as he came to the earth and what Jesus would do. And certainly in, in the book of Ruth, that's, that can be uh, uh, very clear to us. And so we look this morning at, at Ruth 4 and say, how is this true? What does this passage say to us about about Jesus, about what is good news about him. Uh, if you think about, and if you've seen different uh, movies, maybe you saw Titanic, maybe you've seen documentaries, or maybe you've just read about the, the uh, Titanic sinking in the North Atlantic, and when that boat uh, sank, uh, there weren't enough lifeboats for everybody, and there were some people who behaved very heroically and they got everybody else on lifeboats and, and were making sure other people who were weaker than they uh, were getting to safety in the lifeboats. But then there were other people uh, who crowded out and elbowed their way on the lifeboats uh, and, and survived in that way. All of us in, in life um, are, are, are following various things. Uh, people who have been influential uh, to us, uh, maybe a philosophy that just kind of overrides and 
in the United States that's influential to us. Maybe it's a, a father or mother or, or a good friend or, or somebody in society right now or celebrity or business person who uh, to you is very admi admirable. And so you, you look to that person and emulate uh, some of what he does. Um, if you were on the Titanic there and one of the people that had survived, maybe you were on the Titanic as an eight-year-old and you'd survived because somebody had got, gotten you into one of those lifeboats and you saw that person die there in the ocean and go under the surface in that cold water that you had been in or, or felt uh, briefly. Uh, certainly you would think about this person for the rest of your life, wouldn't you? Uh, how admirable uh, that person was. Uh, what gr great character, what would drive somebody to do that, to rescue me, a person uh, he or she didn't even know? Uh, and then maybe you would also remember somebody else who was in your boat, <laughs> who was just looking out for himself or herself and that you had to kind of fight with to get in the boat or you saw even push someone out of the boat so that he had a spot on the boat. As we consider our lives and, and who, we, who we consider admirable, who we consider worthy of emulation or following, we can think about similar things to that. But, you know, we don't always think about is this person worthy of me following? Uh, sometimes the, the person or the thing is just popular. Sometimes it's just, it's just there. And it's a very important question for us to ask, what kind of person am I following? As we look at the book of Ruth, and we've spoken about it in previous weeks, uh, this is uh, uh, certainly about Naomi and, and Boaz, and to some extent Ruth as well, uh, who gets the her name on, on the book, uh, but the book is really about David. And if you look down there in ch chapter 4, if you've still got that open for you, you see that David is the punchline of all of this. And we'll, we'll get to more of that in, in the next couple of weeks. But this is showing David's line. What kind of stock did David come from? Who were his forebears? And we see here that his forebears were, were, were Ruth, and Boaz, and that he came from this, and though, even though David had impure blood for an Israelite, that is, he, he came from, from partially from Moabite blood, that this was honorable Moabite blood, and that he came from a father who was certainly an admirable man. And so we think about that as we go through all the various chapters, one through four, of Ruth, and, and and look at this and consider, not for us, we're not in the days of Old Testament Israel, considering is David and are his sons worthy for us to follow as king? But we're in the days where everybody needs to ask, is Jesus, son of David, descendant of David, worthy of being the one I, I follow? I admire more than any other. The one whom I emulate. And so those are the things we have in mind. And just notice here as we get to chapter 4 of Ruth that attention has drawn itself away from Ruth. Ruth is not the center of attention. She's mentioned three times here but she's not even on the scene at this point. Uh, really the more prominent one of the women is Naomi. Uh, Naomi here gets six mentions and it's really Naomi's future that's at stake. That's what it's what's being considered, not not Ruth's. Ruth is an agent of Naomi's future. Okay. And really the main player in this passage as we get to chapter four is Boaz. What did Boaz do? What did Boaz say? What did Boaz accomplish? And why was he doing that? And we saw that at the, toward the end of chapter 3. Boaz becomes the, the main feature of this book. And, and indeed, it's appropriate as the, the, the forebear of David, the, the forebear of, of Jesus. What is Boaz like? What does he do? Is he somebody that should be emulated? And so this morning, we really have just one point. One point. And if you like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome to do that. Uh, if you want to just listen, that's okay too.
But, but our, our point this morning as we look at this text is this. Follow Jesus. That's the message of this text. Follow Jesus because he put you and others first. Follow Jesus because he put you and others first. This is the character of Jesus. He put you and others first. He was one on the deck of the ship. He was one out in the cold waters of the North Atlantic for however long he could survive, getting people who were hanging on to a board, like Leonardo DiCaprio, right, um, into, into a boat who were, who were lesser than he. Jesus is one who's put us first. So we look at that character and we say he's worthy of our emulation. So the point number one, point number one, follow Jesus because in his putting others first, he's, he's perfect in this. He's perfect in this. And he, of all people who have ever lived on the face of the earth, is most admirable. That's your blank there. He's admirable and worthy of your following. He's admirable and worthy of your following. See it there in verse 5, and then again in verse 10. Look there in your Bibles. Verse 5, then Boaz said, on the day you see his, the near kinsman was going to um, buy this land. He says, the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth or Moabites, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. And then down in verse 10, he says, I have also acquired Ruth the Moabites, uh, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name, not Boaz's name, but Elimelech's name, his name, Elimelech's, this dead uh, husband of Naomi, so that his name uh, will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. So just a bit of background there. We saw it in Deuteronomy 25. When God's people came into the promised land, uh, every family got their own plot of land. And that plot of land is called in the Old Testament over and over again their inheritance. So your inheritance that got passed down generation after generation after generation was this land. And so God made provision in his law in Deuteronomy 20, 25. If somebody dies who is the one who has received the inheritance who's going to pass the inheritance down to his son so that the name of the first inheritor who came in you know, with Joshua into the promised land, so that that name is carried on in Israel, remains on the books, on the records, is not forgotten in Israel. If somebody who's the inheritor of that, who's the current owner, the dad has died, is the current owner of that, has a wife, but he has no kids, and he dies, then there are no kids to inherit the land. And so the inheritance in that person's name will be blotted out from Israel. It will, no, it will not have, uh, I can't say that word, it won't be a perpetual, perpetuity, no. It won't be perpetual. It won't continue on in Israel. And so there's this, this concern that this inheritance goes on and that the name of the person is carried on in Israel. And so what's happened in the case of the book of Ruth is there's this man, Elimelech, and he's from the tribe of Judah. He's a Bethlehemite, too. He lives in, around Bethlehem, and he's got a plot of land, but he dies. And Naomi is his widow, but they've, they've had two boys, but both of the boys have died. And so there's nobody who will inherit this land and Elimelech's name will be blotted out from the records of Israel. No male heir to carry on this land. And so that's what's being discussed here. And so you see Deuteronomy 25 is being carried out, and what the, the way uh, when somebody dies and has no uh, heir to take on the land, then an unmarried brother of this dead man is to come and marry the widow. And the firstborn child of this brother and the widow, who are now married, the firstborn child takes the name of his mother's husband, 
not his physical dad. You get that? So in the case of Ruth here, what's going to happen is Ruth is going to marry Boaz. But the first boy child they have is going to carry on the name of Elimelech, not Boaz. And though Boaz buys this land, he won't inherit it. He's buying it. It's like an investment you buy in the stock market. You buy this stock, and as soon as, as, soon as your kid is old enough, you, you, you lose it. Okay? It's not going to maintain it. It's not going to be Boaz's land. He's just giving a handout, and he's never going to get paid back for it. And so we see the, the selflessness of Boaz in this passage. He puts others first. He puts his dead relative, Elimelech, first. He's concerned that Elimelech's name not be blotted out in Israel. He's concerned that Elimelech have descendants. And what if Boaz marries Ruth, which he does, and only has one boy? Then his estate is in danger. Because his first boy takes over the inheritance of Elimelech, Elimelech's land. But Boaz has his own land that he needs a male heir for. And you see that concern in the nearer kinsman, don't you? He says in, in verse 6, look at verse 6 there, at this, when the kinsman redeemer finds out, oh, I've got this responsibility, I'll have to marry Ruth and my first male child will we'll take this land away from me and it will no longer be part of my estate. Verse 6, at this the kinsman redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. <laughs> it really should be, I won't do it, right? It's a matter of will. Um, so you see here in Boaz, him putting others first. It's like if you had a neighbor, or let's put it in closer terms, you had a cousin, and your cousin lived in Idaho. And your, your cousin dies, and there are no kids. You're not married. You marry the, his widow, and you have a child. And as soon as that child gets old enough, he takes over the land, and you have to move off. You get nothing from it. Okay. Selflessness, putting others first. Uh, so we consider who we follow, and we look in A here, 1A. We follow Jesus because he put others first. And in A there, most are concerned about themselves, and not you. When you look around in the world, when you look at a celebrity who's admirable uh, or admirable, when you, when you look at, at uh, somebody in your field of expertise, um, who's admirable, um, they don't care about you. Um, and they probably don't know your name. Um, but even those who do know your name, if push came to shove and it became a, an issue of, of them being able to keep their house and you being able to keep your house, they would keep their house and they'd say, oh, I'm really sorry you're losing your house. Right? But not with Jesus. He's concerned about others having an inheritance, you having an inheritance, just like Boaz here. But most are concerned about themselves, not you. Even people who are very admirable are not concerned about you. And so, B, it makes no sense to follow them. We have to keep that in mind as we follow people. Do they care about me? Are they, are they selfless? Or do I admire them because they've been very selfish? I was listening to something just uh, yesterday on my way back from taking Monica back up to school, and it was talking about Charles Ponzi. You've heard of Ponzi schemes? You know, to Bernie Madoff and all that kind of thing. So I was listening all about uh, Charles Ponzi and, and, what, he, and what he did. And, uh, you know, he was concerned about himself, and he put all these people in financial ruin like Bernie Madoff uh, uh, did. Uh, just, just concerned about himself. But his desire as a young uh, immigrant into this country is he had known people back in Italy who were people of wealth. 
And then he came across in New York City all these people in New York City who were people of wealth, and he wanted to follow them. And, and, and that's, that's, that's all he cared about was, was wealth. But the way he got people into his scheme uh, was he had all these people who didn't realize that he, Charles Ponzi, had no real concern for them. He was just taking them for their money. And so we want to be people as individuals who are careful about following people who care about us. Um, it makes sense to follow someone who's not selfish, who's not self-interested, who considers us. I just finished reading a book called uh, Lead for God's Sake. And, and I read the book because Urban Meyer, who's won three national championships, reads this book like twice a year. I saw it on Facebook. He's read this book like twice a year. During his year off between Florida and Ohio State, he, uh, someone, Todd Blackledge, recommended this book to him. So I bought the book and I read it. It's okay. It's kind of, it's kind of a Christian uh, book there. But, but the main point of the book is, is this. There's this coach, and it's, all a, it's, a, it's a novel. Uh, and and the, in the novel, it's this coach. He's been a very successful high school basketball coach in Kentucky. And he's won state championship after state championship. And in this one year, he's having trouble motivating his team. And he wonders what he can do. And what he realizes is that he's put winning state championships above his players. And his players all know it. And so they're tremendously demotivated. And the book is about him realizing uh, as a coach that loving your players and your players as teammates loving each other and caring more about each other is more important than wins. Um, I, I had a coach when I was uh, uh, in, in uh, basketball at, at one point um, between middle school and, and high school, and we all realized on our team that uh, he had been uh, gunning for a varsity position uh, the year before, and he didn't get it. So he was stuck coaching the JV again another year. And I rose up as a freshman, I was a sophomore that year, and I was on this JV team. And it was very apparent he did not want to be coaching us. Um, but on top of this, it was very apparent that he was all out for wins because he needed a good, successful season from us so that he could get a varsity position somewhere else that next year. It was tremendously demotivating for us as a team. And we had a good team. As seniors, we were 20 and 3. No thanks to me, I sat the bench. <laughs> but uh, we were very demotivated by that. And in fact, some of you know my dad um, was a, a better basketball player than I, and I told my dad after that season, I don't think I'm going to play basketball next year. Um, I ended up playing basketball because he got a varsity position, <laughs> this coach. And another guy came in, and it was a wonderful year, my junior year. Um, but, but that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about following somebody. It's much easier to follow somebody, isn't it, if you know that that person cares for you. And if it's somebody who's admirable but doesn't care for you, look out. Look out. And so, number two, uh, follow Jesus. Uh, follow Jesus because he puts you and other Christians first by redeeming you. That's your blank there. By redeeming you so that you now have an eternal inheritance, an eternal, eternal inheritance. Follow Jesus because he puts you, he puts you and other Christians first by redeeming you so that you now have an eternal inheritance inheritance. Okay, so first of all, A, what does redeem mean? I always got confused by this. You know, I think if you're like me, you hear the word redeem and you think of a coupon, right? <laughs> you redeem this. And a coupon can be redeemed for like one thirty second of a cent. And I don't know what that means. Look on the back of a coupon. You know, you, <laughs> and you see different coupons. You, this can't be redeemed for this and that. What does redeem mean? Simply redeem means to buy back. And that's your blank, to buy back or to give something in exchange for something else. So when you redeem a coupon, and it says, I found a coupon about four years ago for Rice Krispies, and it was for seven cents off. Okay, it was from 1972, the coupon was. Seven cents off Rice Krispies. Ooh, I'm buying that. Um, <laughs> but you redeem a coupon. You exchange it 
for something else. So we turn in a coupon, dollar off, and we exchange this coupon for a dollar off of that box of Rice Krispies. Okay, so that's what redeem means. To exchange something, to give something for something else in return. And so what does that mean? To trade it in. So what does this mean? Jesus has bought you. He's bought you. He's given something in exchange for something else. He redeemed you. He redeems everybody who takes him as their king. Okay. So Boaz is a redeemer. Okay. But uh, there can be a rejection by Naomi, by, um, by Ruth. But they don't reject him. We, we read in the rest of the chapter there. But Jesus has bought you if you're a believer in him. He's redeemed you. And what has he exchanged for you and for your eternal inheritance? What did he give? Well, he gave you, here's your second blank there, his life. He didn't turn in a coupon. He didn't turn in a coupon for your life. Um, he didn't give a good speech for your life. Um, he didn't give a bunch of money, like Boaz, for your life. He gave his life for your life. That's how he is your redeemer, the redeemer of all who believe in him. He's given his life for you. So he's a redeemer. So see there, Jesus gave his life in order to do what? To maintain your name. We're going to look at a couple of aspects of Jesus' redemption of you, his people, who have believed in him. Jesus gave his life in order to maintain your name on the town records, so to speak, in the kingdom of God. This is what Boaz is doing, right, in 5 and 10. We, we read those verses again just a moment ago. Jesus says, I'm going to buy this land. You see that Naomi is selling the land that belongs to her husband, her dead husband, Elimelech. She needs the money to live. She's selling the land. And so, if somebody buys that, and it needs to be a kinsman, he's buying that land so that Elimelech's name is not eliminated from Israel. Okay. So how does that work? How does that work for us, this redemption in order to maintain our name? Well, just like Boaz gave his money, and in a sense, his life in marriage to Ruth, okay, his life was going to change because of this. But just as Boaz gave his money primarily and, uh, 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 so that uh, his relative, Elimelech, would have his name perpetuated in Israel, so Jesus gave his life literally, his physical life. He gave his life literally to be the husband of his church. Boaz gave his life to be the husband, and part of what he gave his life, to be the husband of the church. Jesus is the bridegroom. The church is the bride of Christ. Jesus gave his life so that, in order that, he might be the husband of his church so that your name would not fail to be on the public records of the kingdom of God. And what are these town records or these public records of the kingdom of God today? That's your next line there in your outline. The town records, verse 10, of the kingdom of God are the Lamb's book of life. They're the Lamb's book of life that we see in Revelation 20. Also, we see it in Revelation 5. They're the scroll there in Revelation 5 with the seven seals that nobody has earned, that's your blank, has earned a right to open but Jesus. So there are a number of ways this is working. In Boaz's case, only he had the right once that near kinsman rejected his right. Only Boaz had the right through his relation to Elimelech, and he had the money, but most importantly, the willingness to buy this land and redeem the name of Elimelech, to keep Elimelech's name on the public records in Bethlehem. So he buys this land. He has the willingness to do it. He has the right to do it. He buys this land that Naomi is selling and he marries Ruth and then he's willing to produce offspring 
with Ruth so that Elimelech's name remains on these records. You see the reluctance in verse 6 of the near kinsman. He's, he has the right to buy the land, but he's not willing to do it. He's not willing to be Ruth's husband. And that's the deal breaker, isn't it? He, he doesn't want to be Ruth's husband. He doesn't want to give up the land for Elimelech's sake. He's willing to buy land to build his own estate, to have more land. But he's not willing to buy land that he's just going to lose 100%. Likewise, Jesus for you. Revelation 20 shows us the Lamb's book of life. And this book of life is, is the list of names who are going to go on for eternity to be in the new heavens and the new earth, to live with God, to be in his presence forever and blessed. And Revelation 20 shows us in that picture there that that's what eternal life is, is determined by. When Jesus sits on his judgment throne in chapter 20, as we read there, he's got these, these books that record all the things that everybody's done, good and bad. And everybody's judged by these things. And the standard is perfection. And so that's bad news for us. All our acts, all our thoughts, all our words have been recorded. And they're on these books. And the standard to make it into the new heavens and the new earth is that there is no sin on, under our name in those books. And we're told that those whose names are in these, these books and their sins are recorded there are cast off into the lake of fire for eternity. But on the other hand, there's this other book. It's the Lamb's book of life. And we're told in the, the, that last verse of chapter 20 there, those whose names are written on the Lamb's book of life go on into the new heavens and new earth. That's the town record. Chapter 5 of Revelation presents that book of life in the form of a scroll. It's like a scroll with seven seals on it. And heaven at the beginning of chapter 5 is, is, is in distress. Even these souls of people in heaven who have died in faith are in distress because they know when final judgment happens, my name needs to be read. Because that's what going into the new heavens and the new earth is based upon whether my name is read, whether my name is found to be on the Lamb's book of life. But there's nobody worthy in chapter 5 of Revelation, worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. That's what it says there. And that's why heaven is distressed. What if I'm a dead soul here and I'm here with God now, but I don't make it into the new heavens and new earth because there's nobody worthy to open the scrolls to read my name. But then there's rejoicing in heaven because Jesus, having been killed on a cross, has risen. A lamb who's been slain arrives in heaven. A lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus descended from Boaz of the tribe of Judah. He arrives in heaven and it's declared he is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because he has purchased people for himself with his blood. He can take this, he can take this scroll and he can read these people's names because he's bought them. He's redeemed them with his blood. And so he can take those people into an eternal inheritance, into the new heavens and the new earth. This makes Jesus worthy. And nobody else had the right to take that scroll and open its seals. Nobody has the right to read those names except for Jesus because he selflessly redeemed you and me. He gave his life that we might have ours. He came to earth to earn the right as Boaz had had the right to have your name read at final judgment as being a member of God's kingdom. Elimelech's name was in danger of going off the records 
And so Boaz makes sure that doesn't happen. He makes sure Elimelech and his descendants have an inheritance. And Jesus has made sure that you have an inheritance by buying you, by redeeming you with his blood. Okay, second aspect of this, D. Jesus gave his life as a redemption. That is, he exchanged his life for something else so that you are now, through faith in him, guaranteed to have an eternal inheritance. This inheritance is the something else for which Jesus exchanged his life. Again, we read about this in 5 and 10. This was Boaz's concern. Why does Boaz buy this land? Not for his own estate's sake. The nearer kinsman sees that, ooh, this wouldn't be for my estate's sake. So I'm not interested. But Boaz is interested in the estate, the inheritance of somebody else. And so he buys the property so somebody else can have an inheritance. And so we get to Matthew 25, 34, which uh, I read again uh, for you as we began here and that Carl read for you here. I'll read it once more. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, at final judgment, when all his angels are with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. Okay, this is Revelation 20, what Carl read for us. Final judgment throne. He sits with those on his throne in heavenly glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him. Then the king, verse 34, will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. Okay. This is how Jesus fulfills the book of Ruth. Take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Boaz says to Naomi when he buys this property, take your inheritance. This inheritance you've had since we came into the promised land through Joshua. But that's just a shadow of Jesus. Jesus is much bigger. And he says to us at final judgment, take this inheritance which was determined for you, not when Joshua entered the promised land, a physical land in Israel, but take this inheritance which was determined for you, set for you to have before I created anything. And so Jesus gave his life as a redemption so that you through faith in him are guaranteed to have an eternal inheritance. And that's what he will say to you at final judgment. Take your inheritance that I bought for you with my blood on the cross. I didn't die on the cross for myself. I didn't die on the cross because I had sins to pay for. Jesus didn't have any sins to pay for. He didn't have to go to the cross. He's selfless. He thinks of you. He thinks of me. And he dies for others, not for himself. He had no sin for which to die. He dies for you. So 1 Peter 1.4 speaks of us having an eternal inheritance through faith in Jesus. So our conclusion. And listen to these final questions. And here's what we say. Since Jesus has redeemed you with his life, and that's your blank, since Jesus has redeemed you with his life to give you an eternal inheritance upon your death, he is the most worthy one to lead you in your life. Okay. So since Jesus has redeemed you with his life to give you an eternal inheritance upon your death, since Jesus gave his life so that you have an eternal inheritance, he is the one most worthy to lead you in your life today. So consider these questions as we close. Who else has done so much for you? Anyone here know somebody, have someone who literally gave his life or her life so that you would have an inheritance? Anyone have somebody push them out of the way of a train or of a bus? Probably not. Probably none of us know anybody who's done that for us, who's given his life for us. 
that we would have an inheritance. Nobody but Jesus has done so much for his people. And no one in life will lead you half as well. If Jesus gave his life for you, he will lead you in your life today in the direction he points you through his word. And we'll talk about more of this uh, next week. He will lead you today well. He didn't spare his own life because he cared so much about you. So in your life today, he cares that much about you and he wants to lead you in all the things that you're doing. Those two things we get from this first part of Ruth chapter 4. Jesus is worthy of your following because he has redeemed you with his life. Let's pray.